Jesus' name, amen. So, if we started talking about how we interact in the world, one of the things we likely would say is that we generally, as human beings, tend not to take sides. We wouldn't want to be seen as somebody who falls clearly on one side or another side. We kind of like to be a little bit discreet. But the reality is we do take sides. For example, if I were to ask you this morning, if you happen to know the answer, some people may not know, what laundry detergent do you use at home? The answer would pretty quickly be a particular brand. Uh, my suspicion is that very few of us would, uh, would say, whatever happens to be on sale this week. No, 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 we, we get centered into certain things and that's a way of taking sides. We align ourselves with certain things. If we were to talk politics, my suspicion is we take sides. I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking we do that. So does God take sides? Well, we certainly would think God wants to be on our side. And if we talk politically, both parties in this country think that God's on their side. But does God really take sides? The answer this morning comes through the scriptures. The answer comes to us in the story that we've just heard from Luke about Jesus being baptized. So John the Baptist is out there in the wilderness, and John the Baptist in Luke's writing really comes at the end time, if you will. Something is up, and into this time of uncertainty and question, when people had great expectation, people were looking for something, John comes out into the public, and he's seen as an end-time prophet. He's one who is announcing, indeed, God is up to something. God is doing something. And in his ministry, he's being very clear with people, inviting them in, welcoming them into a journey and a change. He invites them in first to a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That baptism is a physical washing. He makes it very clear that what he's doing is different from that which the Messiah will do. What he's doing is a physical washing, a symbolic washing that's tied to repentance. And repentance here is not, oh, woe is me, but rather it's a matter of change of mind and heart. What John is calling people to is a change of mind and heart in the midst of a world that's gone astray. It's a change of mind and heart calling people to give up on what has been, give up on complicity with the way of the world and the brokenness of the world, to turn away from injustice and to align themselves with the kingdom values of God. To align themselves with what God calls God's people to be about. And so for those people who are gathering around John the Baptist out in the wilderness, they've already left going to the temple to be there in the wilderness. They're entering into a new life, a new direction, waiting for what God is yet to do. And what we see next gives us our answer to that first question. For what we see next is Jesus stepping into those waters. Jesus, the Son of God, entering into those waters 
and taking sides. Jesus was without sin. Jesus didn't need to be baptized for his sake. Jesus' baptism is for our sake. Jesus enters into our human reality, and in the waters of baptism there, he is aligning himself with taking sides of this is what God is up to. And the taking sides is the taking sides to live out God's values now. So what we see unfold then after that, after we have this moment of the Holy Spirit, this moment of God's voice saying, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased, we see Jesus' ministry unfold and what that ministry unfolds into shows us what kingdom values are. So what does Jesus start doing? He starts hanging out with sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, the lame, the sick, the forgotten. He doesn't run away from those who are broken and hurting and even who have gone astray, but rather walks alongside and invites them into the grace and the love that God has for all humanity. He welcomes them into the kingdom of God to restore them and to call them into who God has formed them to be. We see the kingdom values lived out in who and what Jesus is. And when the powers to be take a look at what is unfolding before them, their answer is to put him onto a cross. Yet it's there at the cross that he takes on the ultimate. It's there on the cross that he defeats sin, death, and the devil for all time. The kingdom of God has broken into this world in Jesus Christ. In the waters of baptism, you and I have been yoked to Jesus' death and his resurrection. In the waters of baptism, we have been ushered into the fullness of the kingdom of God. Now, what we understand is that in the waters of baptism, God makes that promise. We are given grace upon grace. Our sins are fully forgiven removed from us as far as the east is from the west. East and west never meet, you know. God's grace floods into our lives, assuring us that we don't need to worry about the sweet by and by. We are given the promise that we belong to Christ and that we will be with God eternally. But there's something else that comes with baptism. It's not all about receiving, receiving, receiving. We need to hear that promise and hear it clearly. But here's the other edge to this, and this is where it may be uncomfortable. For all those who are baptized, those who claim Christ, we are now called to take sides. We are called to take sides by aligning ourselves to living out the kingdom values now. And that draws us and calls us into looking at how we live our everyday life. How do we live with our family in our relationships there? How do we live with our friends and our neighbors? How do we live and interact with our work life? How do we interact with the world? Just as John the Baptist called people to a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, in the waters of baptism, we are also called to a life of repentance, a life of changing our minds, of changing our hearts, and a moving constantly more and more toward where God is going to what God is up to and what God desires. It may challenge the way we look at our own lives. 
Let's get real. It might affect what we do with our talents, our capabilities. It may challenge us to look at what we do with our money. There he goes again. People just love when the pastor preaches about money. I've heard reviews that say that's the favorite sermon people like when the pastor talks about money. Yeah, I know. None of us like to talk about that because there's always those rich people. Those rich people. I don't know who those people are, but I know that God has given each of us all that we have and even that needs to be looked at. How are we using our resources? What are we doing with our money? When you make $100 and you give $10 to the church, that looks pretty good. When you make $1,000 and you give $100 to the church, that looks pretty good, feels pretty good. When you make $100,000 and you write out a $10,000 check, wait a minute, that's too much money we're baptized, we're called to align ourselves with where God is going, with our talents, with our, with our money, and with our time too. How many of us are idly using time? Maybe it's being consumed with television, or with playing online games, or maybe it's texting while we're driving and everywhere else. You get the idea. In the waters of baptism, we are called into a life of repentance where it's a constantly turning of the heart and mind to where God is leading us because what God has invited us into is a better life, a richer life, eternal life. I pray that during this coming week that you spend some time as I will looking at what I'm doing with my life. Let each of us consider how we are using our talents, our resources, and our time. And let us join together in living that repentant life, seeking only to do what God is calling us to be about. Amen.